Okay, well, it's five after nine and be respectful of everybody's time. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Devin Jones. I'm the executive director of the Mendocino County Farm Bureau. And I'm one of the many organizations that are participating in um, the Sustainable Ag Lands Committee. And we are working um, to administer a grant that was received by the County of Mendocino through the Agricultural Department um, connected to the Sustainable Agricultural Lands Conservation Program. And that is part of the California Climate Investment Program through the state, uh, where there's the cap and trade dollars that have been collected, have been administered through this grant program to work on things such as greenhouse gas emissions, uh, economies, improving public health and the environment. And these are all connected to agricultural conservation practices as well. Uh, so the Williamson Act is a substantial part of that program, uh, looking at agricultural conservation and maintaining working landscapes uh, throughout California. So today is kind of an introductory um, conversation about what the Williamson Act is, uh, what it takes to enroll in the program for Mendocino County, uh, the compliance options and the benefits um, for considering putting your uh, properties within to the Williamson Act. So with that, we're gonna have three presenters today uh, going through um, a few topics. Um, we're gonna ask everybody if you have questions, if you are on join, joining us online via Zoom, um, after each presenter, you can either put the questions in the chat and we're happy to read through those. Uh, you can use the raise hand function and we can call on you individually. For those of you on the phone, um, if there is sort of a uh, moment of quiet and I will call on you uh, if you have a question uh, for those of you on the phone to, to bring those forward. So with that, uh, thank you everybody for being on mute this morning. That's much appreciated. I think we've all got the, the Zoom etiquette down by now. And I'm gonna introduce our first speaker, uh, Taylor Roshen. She's our policy advocate for California Farm Bureau Federation. And so she works uh, with 53 county farm bureaus throughout the state. And she knows the ins and outs of sort of the history of the Williamson Act as well as the state uh, connection um, through the Department of Conservation to the intent of the Williamson Act. So this is gonna be sort of a background information on what the Williamson Act is, uh, where we're at um, with some of the state to county relationships. And so if you have any questions, go ahead and hold them till the end and we'll give Taylor a minute to introduce herself and share her screen. Good morning, Taylor. Good morning and thank you so much for, for having me. I wish I was able to be there in person and, and get out of, Sacramento and my home. Um, but um, as Devin mentioned, I do handle um, a host of issues for Farm Bureau and the government affairs team, land use being a large portion of my portfolio. So as you can imagine, um, with discussions about natural and working lands in the state legislature and in the regulatory spaces, it keeps me busy. So um, I am gonna just share my screen here. Uh, just a moment, sorry. We just talked about the ability, right, etiquette and <laughs> knowing how to use this, this platform. So uh, hold on one second. All right. Sorry, it looks like I need to close some things to get there. All right, here we go. Can everyone see this? All right, great. So um, I just wanna tell you a little bit about the background of the Williamson Act, um, the impetus for its passage, and then how it's been implemented over the last, uh, geez, almost 60 or 60 plus years. Um, the And my email is here. You can certainly reach out to Devin as well. And I'm sure she's happy to share that offline if you have follow-up questions that maybe aren't best for this format. Um, the Williamson Act program was initiated in 1965 by an assembly member, John Williamson, um, known sort of as the, the grandfather of agricultural land conservation and preservation. Um, the, the reason for its initiation was really around a couple things. One, we saw rapid population growth and economic growth in California post-World War II. And I think we know with population growth, it means we have um, greater development happening of residential and commercial facilities. At that point, there was a real pressure being placed on agricultural lands to develop to higher intensity uses. And there was an economic factor as well. You have to remember that the Williamson Act was passed 
prior to the initiation of Prop 13 that would have limited um, the ability for local jurisdictions to increase property tax uh, valuations each year at a, at a stagnant, at a static amount. Um, and so local jurisdictions saw an economic incentive. Um, I can assess properties at a higher rate um, if they have that greater return on investment. Um, and so there, there was almost an economic incentive to facilitate the transition of ag lands. Um, we also saw rapid increases of land valuations and that made ag property um, tax um, liabilities really difficult to keep up with. Um, we don't have necessarily hard data from that time period, but we certainly have anecdotal um, data from those that held property at that time, sort of speaking to uh, my production valuation doesn't outpace my property tax liability. And so um, uh, Mr. Williamson said, well, we need to find a way to help um, maintain the, uh, the protective nature of our agricultural farming and ranching lands, as well as open space um, in a way that doesn't financially disincentivize them. And so um, this was really the, the California Land Conservation Act, which is now known as Williamson Act, was really a way to try and value ag lands at their true agronomic values in exchange for restricting the utilization of that property for definitive ag and open space purposes. Initially, there was a, when the bill passed, it was very controversial. There was lots of concerns that, that local jurisdictions were gonna see huge property tax losses. Um, the other side of the coin was there was a lot of people who, um, a lot of private landholders who didn't believe it was really worth their investment. And so the first two years, we had a relatively slow start of only about 200,000 acres. Um, right now, we're at about 16 and a half million, if not um, maybe a little less than that, since the data is a little tricky to get to, but 200,000 acres at a time when there was significantly less development in California was um, very piddly. Um, we had a couple other things that happened. Article 13 of the California Constitution was passed um, and that really set the policy of the state of California to preserve open space um, and agricultural lands and set the precedent to allow for um, and a constitutional finding to say, we should be valuing property at the, the, the value at which its actual use is, not its projected use, which complements the Williamson Act's intention of saying, if it's a restricted operation um, or restricted development that can happen on this property, we should honor that through um, deductions or, or, or property tax assessments that, that meet that actual use. Then in 1971, so it was about six years after the passage of uh, Williamson Act, um, we did see you know, greater acreage totals um, and with the passage of, Pro of Article 13 of the California Constitution, which I think now is Article 28, um, the, the California legislature and the administration saw fit to develop a covenant with counties to say, you are taking on um, implementing this statewide policy of preserving open space and ag land. And so we are going to use a formula to be able to um, to event or to provide back the lost foregone property tax revenue that you would have otherwise been able to achieve if you had not valued that those agricultural lands at the agricultural use value. And so um, there was a formula that was created. It was an offering to the counties on an annual basis based on how many acres of land um, prime and non-prime that you had under Williamson Act contracts. Williamson Act has always been a voluntary program for counties. There's no obligation that they complete, that they have, that they allow for contracts in their jurisdiction because clearly they are going to see property tax deductions happen or, or property tax revenue losses happen. Um, but we did at this time see every county in California have active Williamson Act properties and contracts in the 80s and 90s. And um, then, as I mentioned, Prop 13 passed in 1978. It was known as the California Taxpayer Revolt, really. Um, and that uh, put additional caps on um, the amount that, um, that local jurisdictions can assess value at um, year over year or upon um, you know, large substantial new development or um, the sale of that property. So uh, we have seen some data that said from 1978 to 1991, the average tax savings for a private landholder enrolled in Williamson Act was around 40 to 90%. Um, I think some of those tax uh, savings hold true still to the program. And that's really a representation that this, this program is uh, generally pretty sustainable and, and um, it does have high enrollment by private landholders. 
Um, we're just going to go over some basic objectives. Um, in addition to it being voluntary for local jurisdictions, it's voluntary for private landholders to participate. So they voluntarily agree to restrict the use of their property for an ag use. So that's farming and ranching purposes. There's some definitions of what agricultural activities and agricultural uses are allowed. Um, originally, it also had an allowance for open space. So uh, these are things like wildlife habitat areas, wetlands, um, some USDA uh, program activities, um, scenic corridors for highways, things like that. And there is an allowance to have compatible uses within that. So um, some of you might think, well, I have an ag property, but I also have a family home on that property, or I have a barn on that property. Um, those sorts of uh, fixtures would be considered compatible, um, or have a pump house or something else, th those would be considered compatible with the agricultural use. Um, the compatibility, the, the portion of the property that's compatible, however, cannot overwhelm or subsume the agricultural use of that property. Um, so we can't put in, um, you know, a bunch of track homes on 90% of the property and have 10% be ag and still be eligible for Williamson Act contracts. Um, the goals of the program, as I mentioned, were really about recognizing the importance and the value of agricultural lands as um, social resource issues or, or social, social capital um, and as economic capital for California. Um, and that was sort of buttressed by Article 13 um, with the state's policy around um, ag protection. It was also to try and help look and encourage local governments to incorporate ag and open space elements into their general growth patterns. Um, as I mentioned, we saw this huge explosion of development happen post uh, World War II. We saw that again, I think, where we're continuing to see it with the impetus for affordable housing development and, and commercial development here in California. Um, and so it was really a, one of the first sort of smart growth um, uh, comp um, complementary policies um, here in California. Um, generally speaking, a private landholder voluntarily enters um, a, a agreement, a contract with a local jurisdiction for a 10 year restricted development of their property. Um, now contracts do annually renew, meaning every year the 10 year clock starts again on that contract. Um, and in exchange for restricting the use of your property to what the local jurisdiction deems to be agricultural use, open space, or some compatible use, um, you get a property tax deduction um, based on how the assessor chooses to value the restricted value of your property. And they get data from uh, the information that you remit back to them on what types of crops you're producing, what's your acreage for each of those crops. Um, some of the obligations, um, local jurisdictions have an obligation to establish the agricultural preserve. Um, this is an area by state law that has to be at least 100 acres and all contracts are within that preserve area. It's really a dedicated area within the local jurisdiction for um, agricultural and open space uses. Um, the county also has an obligation to establish uniform rules, which generally speak to, these are the provisions of the contract. These are the procedures that you have to follow. Here's the fees. This is the appeal structure that you're eligible to if you disagree with some determination. Um, and the like. And so um, there is a requirement, um, and I think this is Mendocino's requirement as well as many other counties, that contracts, individual contracts um, within the uniform rules have to be at least 10 acres of prime land or 40 acres of non-prime land. So parcel sizes um, have to meet those minimum standards in order for them to be eligible for a contract. And in Mendocino County, it looks like you guys have about 50% of the parcel or half the parcel has to be at least for a qualifying use and qualifying use means um, agricultural use for the most part. Um, there are um, the ways that, that uh, we try and define commercial agricultural use or agricultural use is set by looking at some of the income requirements per acre or using gross farm income for the agricultural use of that property that helps the assessor decide what's the restricted value of that property. 
Um, the local jurisdiction also has the ability to determine what constitutes a compatible use to some extent. Um, the state and the Department of Conservation on the state level have set general guidelines for what they deem to be compatible. And I think one of the biggest takeaways is that um, a compatible use cannot um, remove the ability of the underlying principal agricultural use of that property. So um, a compatible use may not be um, you know, developing a, a huge swimming pool, um, knowing that you can't uh, remove that pool at a certain point and bring that property back and that, and that soil back to um, prime agricultural quality. Um, and then they also conduct assessments on what the restricted value or the valuation of your property is under that restricted agricultural use. Um, the state has some obligations as well, though their obligations have gone uh, down pretty precipitously. Um, as I mentioned, they give guidance to the counties on what compatibility means. Um, they do help with appeals and contestations. So if a contract holder um, you know, wants to contest evaluation or they want to initiate um, or, they, or they, that their contract has been canceled and they'd like to appeal that decision or if they disagree with the local jurisdiction's determination that some factor is compatible or incompatible, they can go and pursue a process through that. Um, and then historically, as I had mentioned before, the Department of Conservation was responsible for providing subvention payments. So that's that foregone property tax revenue um, to the counties on an annual basis. Um, I'll get into it later, but, but eventually that was stripped away in 2009 during the budget crisis. So that's no longer an obligation of the State of the Department of Conservation. And then private landholders have some obligations as well. Um, so clearly you have to restrict uh, the type of use of your property to that which is explicitly allowed in your county's uniform rules. Um, you are also responsible for initiating cancellation. If you want to start to get out of that process, you have sort of two ways to do it. One, you can initiate an immediate cancellation of uh, your property or your contract. That comes with an incredibly hefty fine. So it's about 12 and a half percent of the non-restricted value. So if in current day there was an evaluation of your property on what would be the highest and best use of that property, you would have to pay um, 12 and a half percent of that non-restricted value to the county in exchange for immediately exiting the, exiting the contract. Um, the other option that's pursued more frequently is initiating non-renewal. So that essentially means one year you would say, let's say two, in the year 2000, you say, okay, I want to initiate non-renewal. You would allow your contract to wind down over that nine-year period until you reach the conclusion and it wouldn't renew, auto-renew over those, um, those nine years for the duration of the contract. And then um, you are also obligated, and this is something that's been really difficult for a lot of counties to get a hold of, is to return your report statement to maintain ag preserve eligibility. Some of these are look like surveys where you report out what you're producing, how many acres, um, and really that provides your local jurisdiction the ability to do a proper assessment of, the, of, the, of your property. Um, it allows them to collect data on how much acreage that they have, and it allows them to complete their obligation to the state to report to the Department of Conservation um, how many acres are enrolled, is it prime, non-prime, um, what's the foregone property tax revenue, and so that's also an obligation of a private landholder. There's been some recent changes, and by recent I mean 40, 50 years in the making since the passage of the Williamson Act. Um, shortly after the Williamson Act passed, about nine years later, uh, the state passed the Open Space Easement uh, Act, which allowed for um, individual landholders to choose to voluntarily enter into open space easements. These are explicit um, and uh, distinct from Williamson Act property. The principal use is, is open space. And so we did see some Williamson Act properties when the program was initiated and then over time transition uh, to open space as the agricultural the use of that property shrunk or um, landholders just reconfigured their intention. We also saw in the 80s the passage of the Timberland Production Zones. Um, these are uh, areas expressly for timber production and harvesting. Um, there's been a long-standing sort of process of 
as you can imagine, there's quite a bit of timberlands mixed with non-prime lands as well, or agricultural use of non-prime lands like grazing um, within an agricultural preserve. Um, some of those were originally under Williamson Act, some are still under Williamson Act. Um, timber, timberland production zones are supposed to be sort of um, the, the um, the alternative to a Williamson Act contract for timber production. And so there's been a slow process to try and uh, transition some of these timber specific Williamson Act contracts into TPZ. So, so you might see some crossover um, in your area. Um, and, and, and the timber acres can still count towards the county's obligation to create a minimum 100 acre ag preserve. So it's not as though if you have you know, 30 acres of timberlands uh, that your county would have to find some other um, gerrymandered way to get to that 100 uh, acres. Uh, we also saw at the turn of um, in 2000 farmland security zones. So these are basically super Williamson Act contracts. So rather than having a 10 year contract, you would have a 20 year contract and your property tax value would be assessed at 65% of the Williamson Act value. So you'd have your um, highest and best use, you know, your market value here, your Williamson Act value would be here, and then your farmland security zone, if you were within that, would be 65% lower than um, your Williamson Act property. So, you know, th that is a way to try and supercharge um, the bang for the buck by a private uh, landholder to extend the duration of their restricted use contract in exchange for a higher property tax benefit. Um, that does come with a higher uh, cancellation fee. So if you chose to exit a farmland security zone contract, you'd be paying 25% of your market value rate to get out instead of 12.5%, which is a Williamson Act. Um, farmland security zones are generally those areas, and some counties look to them to really be those that buttress urban areas, trying to create those distinct zones of absolute no development. Um, and that's why they're longer. And so generally, um, they are prime, they're, they're termed prime, unique farmland, statewide uh, importance farmland, or local importance farmland. Um, then, as I mentioned, in 2008, 2009, when there were significant, um, there was a significant recession um, in California, and uh, I think the Brown administration was looking for anything and anywhere to cut. Uh, Williamson Act was low-hanging fruit. Um, it was a widely and broadly supported um, local land use program. Um, and so the, the administration decided they, are go they were going to cancel um, the return of subvention dollars or those foregone property tax revenues to local jurisdictions. At that time, it was about $37 million statewide, which uh, speaking now, looking at a you know billion dollar plus uh, budget, it's it's budget dust. That's what we call it in 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 Sacramento. Um, that that dollar figure of thirty seven million in foregone revenue would likely be higher today, um, just because we've had um, property tax in, or property increases in value as um, we've gone through the last um, uh, few years. Um, and then there were two different things that happened in 2011. I think everyone had their fingers crossed in 2009, 2010, that once we exited the recession or we started to see some improvement in the state budget, that subvention payments would be returned. And in that two year period, just as the state's budgets shrunk and the general fund shrunk, so too did local jurisdictions. And so um, foregone property tax revenue became a, a legitimate and still remains a legitimate cost pressure on some uh, counties' budgets. And um, you know, the, it's the idea of what could be, I think, um, that, that's been difficult for some folks to sort of deal with. And so uh, the state saw fit through the legislature to find some outs. Um, one of them was to, we saw a lot of property um, with the advent of the renewable energy market sort of taking off in 2008, 2009, 2010, um, using their agricultural properties if there was water restrictions, because we also were entering into a drought at that time, or if there was a greater revenue potential in putting solar panels, photovoltaic panels on um, properties. And so there was uh, an intention to transition. If you've done this, 
rather than exit the Williamson Act contract, pay the rescission fee, which developers had a hard time sort of eating that cost for private landholders in exchange for placing the panels on their properties. Um, they said, well, you can exit a Williamson Act and simultaneously enter into a solar use easement which is anywhere from 10 to 20 years. Um, same thing, you restrict the use of your property for solar use or renewable energy production, and you only have to pay a 10% rescission fee rather than a 12.5% rescission fee. That did, um, the idea was also, let's not provide a greater financial incentive for people to exit the Williamson Act program, let's provide them with an off-ramp. Um, and then also in 2011, legislation passed and I think um, was generally well supported uh, by quite a few folks trying to give a break, I think, to private landholders and to local jurisdictions to say, okay, 10-year um, contracts and 20-year and contracts for farmland security zones, if the state's not going to honor the subvention covenant, um, then let's go ahead and, and give them a little bit of reduction on the term of their contracts. So um, local jurisdictions have the ability since 2011 to transition Williamson Act contracts rather than 10-year auto renewing to nine years. And then farmland security zone contracts can transition from 20 years to 18 years. So it sounds like it's not that much, but for those that are interested in, in exiting the program or for local jurisdictions, um, you know, every dollar I think has been helpful. Uh, currently, sorry, do I have somebody? Maybe we can hold off just for one more minute. I got, this is my last slide. Um, currently, you'll see the map on the right hand side. Um, we have mo the counties in green offer Williamson Act contracts, the counties in yellow offer Williamson Act contracts and farmland security zone contracts. Um, there are three, con three counties that currently don't participate in Williamson Act. Um, I'm sorry, four counties that don't participate in Williamson Act and one county imperial that's begun their non-renewal contracts. So they, the counties decided we are gonna exit the Williamson Act program um, and we're gonna allow those 10-year contracts or nine-year contracts to just wind down to their uh, final end. And that's because as you can imagine, Imperial has been incredibly uh, economically stricken over the time period with property tax uh, losses among other things. Um, as I mentioned though, we, we have low reporting. So we have, I think it's about 69% of the counties that are participating are actually reporting or the, the acres that are under enrollment are reporting. Um, that doesn't give us great data at the state level or even at the local level to report how many acres are actually within the program. But generally speaking, um, we have relatively high enrollment particularly in agricultural counties. So for those that can't see the map, um, most of the Williamson Act uh, contracts are generally where you would think they would be, up in the North Coast, uh, down in the Valley, in the South Valley region, and then those counties that have Williamson Act contracts and farmland security zones are some of those coastal counties, some of those areas that have a really strong land use policies like Yolo County, um, and then down also in the South San Joaquin Valley, um, where we have um, you know, Tulare and um, we have Bakersfield where, you know, you need to have both tools in your toolbox. Um, statewide, we have, like I said, it's hard to get the total figures. I think a lot of people quote about 16.6 .6 million acres currently under Williamson Act, but I think a more fair number is about 13 million acres uh, currently. Um, about two thirds of that is non-prime lands, mostly used for grazing or open space, and about a third of it is our prime lands. Um, Mendocino County, by last count, it looks like has about 465,000 acres, and Katrina can correct me if that's wrong when she makes her presentation. Um, that's about 10% of the county's total acreage, which is, is pretty consistent, if not pretty good, compared to other counties, especially looking at how significant of a land base um, Mendocino County is compared to other counties here in California. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick update on some statewide efforts to potentially reform Williamson Act and some complementary policies. Um, just so that you understand, I think the significance of the program, uh, its historical significance, absolutely, but its potential policy significance, especially with this administration. 
So um, first and foremost is, as I mentioned, we have an incredible push on both the developer side and in the administration side to build more affordable housing and to build commercial production, commercial facilities um, that help support those additional residents. And so that just puts tremendous pressure on agricultural lands. I think in the last 10 years, we've lost agricultural lands to development uh, to the tune of the size of the, of the state of New York. So we are seeing significant ag land loss. And part of that is just because they're, um, we're building that housing. We have push policies from both folks to try and make it easier, though certainly it's more expensive um, now. And so um, Williamson Act really tries to complement that by saying, let's make sure we preserve as much ag land as we are developing as well. Um, there has always been a discussion about either reinstituting subvention payments to the counties. That's something Farm Bureau strongly supports. We think you made an agreement. Um, you know, when the, when the when the program was passed, uh, the 2008 budget recession is no longer an issue. You've got a you know hundreds of millions of dollars in excess for for certain projects. Um, you know, you've got a budget surplus this year. Uh, let's put, you know, our money where our mouth is and, and try and honor that commitment. Um, there's also some discussion to try and amend the contract terms. So um, there's questions about, well, perhaps if we, if a landholder not only puts their land under Williamson Act contracts, but also does X, Y, and Z um, management practice, let's say they do cover cropping or they provide habitat for pollinators, or they do some other um, public access, like they have a public access easement on there as well for hiking or biking or something else, um, maybe then we'll honor that subvention payment. Um, you know, there's a little bit of a mismatch in not understanding all those things cost money, um, and all those things have consequences in agricultural settings as well. So, um, you know, we think subvention payments first, Extra subventions, if you want to do extra work, is seems like the fair way to go. Um, and then finally, I think with this administration, there is a big effort, especially by Farm Bureau and other groups that are supporters of the program, to reframe its benefits in the way that this administration speaks. So um, there's a big discussion about the capacity for natural working lands to sequester carbon and to mitigate for the impacts of climate change. Um, you know, that's a great opportunity for agricultural and ranching lands to sort of speak to this is what we've been doing. And I'm honoring that commitment to do that in perpetuity, not in perpetuity, but generally in perpetuity with my auto renewing contract um, through Williamson Act. I, I'm, I'm not going to see, I'm not going to allow higher density uses, which generally have greater greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and I'm going to make sure to protect my property for um, that carbon sequestration potential through a Williamson Act contract. So it's a way of sort of mirroring the those two together. The same can be said for biodiversity. Uh, we know lots of these types of agricultural production practices. Um, grazing helps keep down uh, noxi noxious weeds, um, helps native plants thrive, help provide forage habitat for um, wildlife and pollinators. And so it has the benefit of increasing biodiversity, which is a big push if, if you haven't read that um, Governor Newsom and President Biden have signed onto the 30% land savings, 30% water savings by 2030, all in an effort to combat uh, the pretty dramatic loss of biodiversity um, internationally. And then finally, sort of reframing, um, you know, these agricultural lands that are under Williamson at contracts as economic generators, because that's what, you know, we believe they are, working lands work. Um, and they support more than just that individual farming and ranching family, but employees, um, ancillary businesses and uh, trade efforts, both domestically and internationally. And so the economic multiplier effect of agriculture, um, you know, even at its base level of value is, is greater than one. So being able to say, you know, agricultural and ranching lands uh, through Williamson Act contracts and honoring that commitment is a way to, um, to get California back up and running um, is certainly something that, that we're pushing. So lots of stuff and nothing really coming to fruition yet on any of those things, if at all, but um, it does add an interesting new flavor to Williamson Act. So that's all I have. I hope that's all right. I'm happy to open it up to any questions. Well, thanks, Taylor. Uh, I actually learned a few things myself, so that was good, always exciting. Um, so does anybody have any questions? Um, 
please either raise your hand or just feel free to unmute yourself and we'll try to uh, monitor that. Or you can put those in the chat as well if you're more comfortable with that. And I don't know how many folks are on the phone versus um, on their computers, but I'm happy to share the PowerPoint that I kind of went through with Devin and then she can email it out to all the participants today. And I should have mentioned this at the beginning, so my apologies, but we are going, we have recorded this presentation and we will, we will upload that link as well. Um, it's going to be po posted on to the um, Resource Conservation District website, so where you went to register. Uh, we will have that link there as well. But um, Taylor, that'd be great if you can get that to me. We'll be happy to post that as well. So uh, not seeing any questions. Um, Janice, did you have a question? Oh, I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I just your little screen lit up on ours. And so I wasn't sure if you were asking a question or it might have just been back, background noise. So phone, this is my first Zoom call ever. So oh, good. am I shouting? No, no, you're good. OK, well, I had a, a couple of questions. Um, my ranch has been in the Williamson Act since I bought it in 1988. And uh, before that, the former owner had it for quite a few years, I, I'm not really sure how long. And uh, I wondered if there is, it's, uh, I have a crazy for cattle now, and I wondered if there is a, a time that I can rest the land for a year or two because of drought and uh, various other things and still be in compliance. I don't know if this is the right person to be asking. So, yeah. so so Janice, why don't we just hold on a sec? Um, well, I think Russ is gonna get into a lot of that unless Taylor does wanna address it, but I think that's gonna be sort of falling into Russ's um, presentation as well as Katrina's in terms of compliance. So is that okay? Yes, that's fine, thank you. Um, we did have one question come into the chat uh, from Emily Tecchio. She says she's curious if there has been any discussions on Williamson Act and wildfires, uh, thinking about preventing future um, development in terms of the benefits of some of the Williamson Act contracts. Yes, absolutely. And um, obviously the wildfires have been, have been devastating for both urban and rural communities. One of the silver linings was really talking about how some of these grazing practices, how vineyards, how vegetation management that's just a, a pertinent to ag properties have really served as those fire breaks. And so that was something I omitted, but it was it's an important piece in the discussion of wildfire mitigation. Um, it, it's disappointing that it's only now we're sort of talking about this, um, but certainly in Sacramento, it's a portion of that. And just as, you know, it, Williamson Act contracts create those buffers around urban areas to promote infill development, they too um, serve as those protective barriers for those urban centers um, from, from some of the impacts of wildfire. So great question. Okay, so in lieu of time, um, we're gonna go ahead and move forward. Uh, Russ Ford uh, with Planning and Building Department with Mendocino County is going to be presenting um, and giving the background a bit on just the application process and some of the basic requirements if you are considering um, putting your property into a Williamson Act contract. So Russ, we're gonna pass it to you. Okay, um, thank you. Good morning, Russ Ford, Planning and Building Services. Um, I'm gonna try to share my screen here real quick got three of them, so might be an issue. So can everybody see that? Uh, yes, yeah, so you got the preserve contracts up there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in Mendocino County, this is our Agricultural Preserves and Williamson Act contract policies and procedures. This is the, the guiding document for basically how you enter a contract what the restrictions are, what the requirements may be. Um, this can be found on our website. And just a quick navigation here. If you just go to uh, Mendocino County Planning Department, it'll bring you up here at the top. That link will take you to the planning page. And over here on the left, under regulations, this will take you to the policies and procedures. So, um, just real quick, there is a difference between an agricultural preserve and a Williamson Act contract. Typically in Mendocino County, we approach them as, uh, we create them at the same time. Um, and the analogy that I like to use is, it's, since we deal with building a lot, is if you think of the ag preserve as the building pad, 
that goes down first and then think of the contract as the structure that goes on top of it. So you can have a contract without a preserve. I'm sorry, you can have a preserve without a contract, but you can't have a contract without a preserve. So those are created simultaneously when you go through this process. Um, as Taylor mentioned, the, the size requirements are a little bit different, which can be confusing. So for an agricultural preserve, you need to have at least 100 acres for that. And you're allowed to combine uh, ownership, combine properties that are adjacent to get to that 100 acre number. And then for the individual contracts, you can have contracts as small as 10 acres, depending on what the, the zoning type of the land. So for prime agricultural land, which is typically what we consider to be the ag zoned properties, you can have contracts as small as 10 acres. For the larger ones, the non-prime, which is typically what we look at as our rangeland or um, uh, forest land zonings, those have to be at least 40 acres. So when you apply for it, let's see, we have, um, I don't have a copy of the application up here, but we just have a general application form. You just say what you're applying for. Um, the current application fee is $3,750.47 for creating a new contract and preserve. And then within this document, there's a, a couple of key requirements. First, you must be in one of those uh, compatible zonings, either ag, rangeland, or um, forest land. You have to meet that minimum acreage size. And then as of 2016, when we revise these policies and procedures, there's now a uh, financial requirement, which is shown here on page 10, this table 5-2. So depending on what use you have of your ag property, you're going to have to meet this financial requirement somehow. And typically, you know, we want receipts of sales. So if you've got to, you know, vineyard, you're selling those grapes, whatever money you're getting for those grapes, or, you know, if, you, um, if you've got cattle just for grazing, you put your steer. We just want to see what the, the financial income is from that. And uh, this generally, it's pretty easy to meet this financial threshold, but it does have to be a productive um, ag use. So, um, we still have open space contracts on, on the books here. I don't know that we've actually established a new open space contract in probably 20 years. Um, typically that's more of a conservation easement type of thing, um, but it, it, it is offered. I just wanted to, to mention that. Um, so as far as creating a new contract, the process begins with planning and building services. You'll uh, fill out your application and you'll submit it. We do a review. It goes out to associated agencies for comment. Um, we write our little staff report for it and it goes to the planning commission for initial recommendation. They'll review it based on their, their uh, regulations and make a recommendation to the board of supervisors. So because the contract is between the county and the individual property owner, that's basically the board acting on behalf of the county. It goes to the board for final approval. If they approve the contract, then it kind of shifts back to the applicant and the applicant is required to um, prepare the contract to get that signed and notarized. And also for new ag preserves, you're required to prepare a map. Um, it doesn't have to be prepared by a surveyor, but it should be pretty clear. We're talking, you know, like a larger engineering size map. And then uh, I believe the clerk of the board is the one that actually records that map and the contract with the assessor's office and then the assessor will start their calculation and uh, applying for the contract. So I think that covers um, most of it on my end. Uh, do we have any questions about that for right now? Not seeing any. So Russ, just really quickly, um, maybe you or Katrina, um, are you gonna maybe just kind of peruse through some of the compatible uses really quick? Maybe one of you can do that. I'm not sure who's who might be the best person, just to, you know, not every specific zoning, but just to give people maybe an idea of what a compatible use is and how you, how you guys address that within an application. Sure, so compatible uses, um, Compatible uses are built into the contract because we understand that, you know, just because you have something in, in agricultural production doesn't rule out the fact you might also want to live there and have a house. So basically a compatible use is everything except the, the actual ag land and any roads to access it. So we're talking single family residence, accessory dwelling unit, um, farm labor housing, you know, guest cottage, shops, garages, storage, 
all of that stuff is generally compatible. Uh, it's a pretty broad list. The, the important thing is that those collective compatible uses are, are restricted in size. So all of them together cannot exceed 15% of the contracted area or five acres, whichever is less. So as you start adding those things in, you're, you're kind of filling up this little bucket. And once you get to the top of that, you're sort of tapped out on compatible uses. And so that's something that we review for a property that's in Williamson Act. If somebody applies for a building permit to put up a new shop or something, that's an extra layer of requirement um, that we have to review. And we do have some compatibility forms that um, you would have to submit if, along with that building permit. Okay, thank you. Uh, Angelina, I see your hand is raised. Do you have a question? You just gonna unmute yourself. There you go. Yes, um, you had mentioned about doing the mapping of the property. And I was wondering, once that's on file, we don't have to update that at all, right? Is that correct? Or do we have to update the map every so many years? No, typically once the ag preserve is established, that doesn't uh, change unless you take an action or, or we require you to take an action to update that for some reason. Typically, any of the modifications are to the contract itself. Say, for example, you do a boundary line adjustment, you've got contracted property and your neighbor has contracted property and you want to adjust a, a fence line. We're going to want you to update that contract boundary so that it matches the new line as well but that doesn't affect the underlying ag preserve. So you're not required to make an update to that map. Okay, does anybody else have any questions on sort of the basic application process through the county? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead to our um, third and final speaker. Uh, Katrina Bartlemé is our assessor clerk recorder, and she's gonna touch a bit more um, continuing on where Russ left off, more so on the compliance perspective uh, and the requirements for compliance uh, through the county uh, if you are going to be considering enrolling into a Williamson Act. So Katrina. Hi, um, so just to recap a little bit, we've got almost 4,500,000 acres of um, acreage in Mendocino County, and we've got about 465,000 in Ag Preserve now or in Williamson Act contract, contracts. Um, so we went into a nine-year contract in 2011 with AB 1265, and that was after the subvention was done away with. So the Board of Supervisors wanted to be able to recoup a little bit of money um, with the nine-year contract, so they voted that in. So we've been doing the nine-year contract. So it's a nine-year contract that renews every year. We, um, we renew it as of January 1st. Um, and so that would also mean that if you want to roll out of the, of the Williamson Act, it's a nine-year rollout. So um, you know, that, that helps a little bit um, if you do want to roll out. Um, so once everything is approved by planning and building and then approved by the Board of Supervisors, the clerk of the board brings the map and the contract to the recorder's office and we record it. We then, we verify the, um, the legal descriptions and everything and then it goes to the assessor's office. So how we come up with our um, assessment is um, with soil type. So we have, a, we have several maps in our office and they're colored. Um, they're really cool looking maps. And so we locate where your property is on that soil map. And that would constitute how much an acre um, you're, gonna, you're gonna end up being assessed rather than the market acreage the market price for the acreage. So, you know, it's a, it's a huge savings. Um, you have, once, once you're in the Williamson Act, then we are supposed to, by the policies and procedures, send out a survey every four years. Um, this hasn't been done since 2011. We sent it out with Devin's help, Jim Donnelly's help, Russ's help, and then our county attorney's help. We revamped the um, questionnaire that I think is going to be revamped again because you know then we figured that there were probably some questions that we really didn't need to ask or expand on the questions that we did. So we sent that out in the end of July. And normally you would have the property owner would have 30 days to return the contract. Well, COVID hit 
and are we're still receiving um, surveys. In fact, we got one on Monday. So, um, you know, we, there's going to be a group of us, Russ, um, Devin, Jim Donnelly, um, and our attorney probably that are going to review all those contracts um, or all the surveys, I'm sorry, um, for compliance. So again, Russ kind of um, went over the compliance. You know, you have to you have to use only 15% or five acres can be used for non-qualifying um, uses. So that's something that we look at. And, um, and since I've never been through this before, it's gonna be a big learning experience um, for me as well. So um, I, I'm looking forward to that. I've gone over some of them and have notes on some of them. So, um, you know, uh, there are a few that the, the owner has put non-qualifying, so that will be in the rollout. We've got quite a few that um, did not return it. We have about 665 contracts um, out there now. So, um, and, you know, we've got three boxes of them to go through. So it's gonna be a lengthy process that, that hopefully within the next month we can get started on. Um, it's, you know, it'll, it'll be, it'll be quite the task. So, um, so are there any questions for me other than, than what we went over? Um, Russ, Russ does the majority of the work, so that makes it really nice. And, um, you know, we just, Russ and I work very well together. I'm constantly messaging him with questions and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I'm excited for the future and, um, you know, I, I want to see more contracts come in. So I'm really hoping that people, you know, come up with that. I've been involved in ag the majority of my life. We have horses and cattle and, and um, a couple donkeys and a small ranch south of Ukiah. So, you know, I'm right there with you and, and trying to do everything we can to maintain this. So maybe really quick and uh, just to reiterate Janice's question, and I think this could fall either to Russ or Katrina, but, um, you know, for livestock specifically, you know, there are years, you know, for drought conditions or for what may be it uh, where you might have to do what they call rest rotation, where you might not have livestock uh, out on your property um, for a year or so. Um, and I believe, you know, that is acceptable, but I wanted to make sure to, to put that to Russ or Katrina to answer Janice's question of, of, is that an allowable practice so that within that reporting period of four to five years, whatever we happen to do, um, if she were to say, I rested my property for that year, but she met the qualifications for the others, you know, how is that going to be addressed? Russ, do you know the answer to that? I honestly do not. I can't imagine why it wouldn't be, but I don't know. No, it's not explicitly addressed anywhere in, in the code or in our policies, but um, my take on it is, you know, we look at these contracts as long-term things, nine or 10 years, and obviously every year within that contract, the production is not going to be the same just because of climate. So as long as the, the general use of the property is still within that, that ag use, you know, as like Devin said, that rest, that's an established ag procedure. So that's still the ag use, as long as you're not, you know, ripping out all the vineyards and never putting it back or just getting rid of the cattle and never bringing them back. I don't see why that would be any issue. And for, you know, the most part, if you happen to get a questionnaire that year, say, yeah, you know, we're resting the land for the next year or two, letting the grass recoup, and then we're, we're bringing the cattle back in, you know, 2023 or something, I think that would be completely fine. And Janice, not to speak for you, but I believe you said you had a couple other questions. So I think Katrina or Russ, this would be the opportunity uh, to ask them if you had them. I think that was my main question. Thank you. Did I have another one? I don't remember. And if you had emailed me another question, if you don't mind, I can share it with the group. Um, you had asked, is there a formula for how many head per acre uh, that would be required for compliance? That's right, thank you. There is, there's, um, for irrigated pasture, there's 10 animal units per 13.3 acres. Um, for, for different grass class soils, about the same. Um, there, or one animal per 1.3 acres. Um, there's one animal per 20 acres. It all depends on what soil type um, that, you know, your property is in and, and how much that's going to, 
you know, to affect your land. So it's all based on that. If you have a real brushy area, it says 10 animal units per 400 acres or one animal unit per 40 acres. So, um, you know, brushy and rocks and stuff like that, I, I think that that would be part of that. I see, yeah, I have varied, uh, it's just free range uh, grass and it's not irrigated, but some of it is brushy, some of it is rocky. Uh, I don't know what kind of grass it is, really. I mean, it's not planted, it's just rangeland. Oh, yeah, yeah, and that's what ours is as well. Uh -huh. So maybe as a quick follow up to that, Janice, because everybody's situation is a bit different. And when they transitioned over to the um, economic valuation for qualification, which has just been seen in this last round of um, compliance forms, we did get a, quite a few questions because it used to be premised on numbers of animal units. So probably the best thing if Russ or Katrina were willing would be for you maybe to, you know, make an appointment to speak uh, with one of them if you had a specific question about your own parcel and uh, qualifications. Yes, all right, thank you, thank you. Janice, did you return your questionnaire that was sent out in July? Yes, I returned it. Perfect. And I just wanted to mention that uh, um, <clears throat> the current policies and procedures, that income table for grazing, that's considered a, a non-prime use. So the financial requirement is uh, $2,000 for the gross income of the operation plus $2.50 per acre. So you just kind of do some quick calculations and that's that minimum financial threshold. It actually doesn't mention anything about animal units on that financial table. So it's a, the calculation is a little bit different, I think, since they revised it. And Russ, just really quickly, maybe to build on that, since you're looking at that table, another question and something that's really important for folks is that, um, you know, qualifications for that income, I believe, can be direct income. Um, there's also a couple of asterisk footnotes underneath that chart that allow for um, you to demonstrate, you know, investments and improvements, uh, labor time, you know, fencing, water infrastructure, those developments related to the actual agricultural production operation, I believe can also qualify. Is that correct, Russ? Yeah, so typically for an existing operation, you know, you'd have some sort of receipt about sales and income. Uh, if it's something that you're just developing, like say if you're just gonna, just got a cattle lease or something that you're establishing and you don't have that established income yet, uh, we allow you to use the evidence of capital improvement, say whatever money, however much it costs you to spend on fencing, you can use that in lieu of that initial qualification. And then farther down the process, you know, we'd, we'd um, review that when that questionnaire came out again, once you got the process up and running to make sure you're still compliant with it. Okay, thank you, Russ. Um, Alan, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, I have a, a small question. Um, I'm on the board of the Inland Mendocino County Land Trust. Uh, and I wasn't aware that there was a, uh, Williamson Act for open space. Um, so that's something new for me. And I, I know it's not a common occurrence at the county for applications, but um, I would be interested in just a simple kind of percentage. Uh, when people ask us uh, what sort of a tax uh, incentive or tax break there is for the Williamson Act, uh, how do you, um, how can I compare uh, tax incentives for, how do you handle uh, tax breaks for conservation easements as opposed to say open space or any other Williamson Act classification? Well, I, I asked our appraisers that, that do this all the time. I've only been in this office for about a year and a half. So um, I, and I grew up in elections and clerk recorder. So um, I, I asked them that and the, the answer I got was substantial. That, you know, it's all based on their soils and it's all based on, on, on that, the market versus the restricted and things like that. And the the answer that both of them gave me was it's substantial. Because it's so variable. Yes. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> well, 
Um, so if, if somebody's inquiring about uh, putting their property into a conservation easement, um, uh, probably the most accurate answer would be it's substantial. There's, <laughs> not, there's no, no, no fixed, uh, I mean, it's not like 30% or 50% of their property taxes. It's, it's based on an individual case. Yes. And, and they're more than welcome to call and we can, you know, get their parcel numbers and we can look up what soil, you know, um, what soil area they're in. And then they have a little graph that they, that they, um, that they use and they can give you an estimate, you know, and, but until we actually look at it and process everything, substantial is probably the best answer I can give you. Okay. No, that's a good answer. I like it. It makes plenty of sense. Thank you. Uh -huh. And maybe one thing to add on to that, Alan, would be to either you know, when you touch base with the assessor's office or planning and building would be to see if the parcels in question were in an area where a, an established preserve is already present. Um, if there is no preserve present in that area, there could be some extra steps and uh, required to consider before um, looking into a contract establishment. Great, good advice. Okay, well, there's, we've got some time left. Um, I know there's some folks on the line that haven't asked questions, so this is your opportunity. Um, anybody else have any questions for our presenters today? Kevin, could I ask one that I received via email? Um, just at least we'll be on the recording. <laughs> um, but someone was asking about if they're modifying an existing agreement on a vineyard and they're converting it to cannabis. Um, how does that work in our county? <laughs> Russ? Yeah, I thought we were gonna to get to the whole thing without a cannabis question. But, we uh, were hoping. <laughs> so uh, the short answer is no modification is required. Cannabis is considered a compatible use. So, you know, the, the contract, it's built into the contract. Uh, you just have to keep in mind that all those compatible uses go into that bucket. So if you've already got a house and a barn and a garage and everything else, you know, the space that you can allocate to cannabis is going to be exponentially smaller. You still have to maintain at least 50% of the property in ag use. So, you know, you got to start doing some land calculations and figure out how much space all your compatible uses take and how much vineyard or grazing area you've got left, and then just figure out how you can fit that in there. So um, that's one last chance for questions. Katie, was that all that you received via email? As far as I know, yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so again, just to reiterate, you know, today's workshop was sort of geared more towards introductory um, background for the, those individuals who may be interested in coming into the program. I know some of you present with us today, sounds like you have existing contracts. Um, but just as a reminder, uh, we will be doing a second part of this series on February 24th from 9 to 1030 um, with Russ and Katrina primarily. And the goal for that specific workshop is to really go more into the details regarding existing contracts. Um, with the recent uh, distribution of the compliance forms, I know there was a significant number of questions uh, regarding how do I potentially amend my existing contract? You know, how do I change the boundaries of an existing contract? Um, you know, I had some questions about the qualification process. So just to remind you, um, if you did not register, register for that, uh, to please plan to go back to the Mendocino County Resource Conservation District website and register for that uh, upcoming workshop on February 24th. Uh, we will go ahead and post um, all the contact information um, onto the website, if that's okay. Um, uh, for Russ and Katrina, are you okay with us putting up your emails on that? Yeah. Okay. And we will go ahead and post with the recording as well as uh, Taylor's PowerPoint and her contact information. And so uh, uh, Russ has also posted his contact information over in the chat. For those of you who are online, um, please take a minute. You can go ahead and, and write that down. And we will also go ahead and um, provide the links um, 
uh, to the existing contract information for the county, as well as the um, Williamson Act uh, governing, governing documents that are available. So for those of you who might want to take a look and get a little bit of better idea of what the um, language is within those policies that were reviewed today. So uh, with that, does anybody else have any additional questions? Okay, I just want to give a big thank you to our speakers. Thank you to Taylor and Russ and Katrina. We appreciate your time this morning uh, for talking about a fairly complicated topic and in a limited amount of time. Uh, we hope that everybody picked up some information. And again, feel free if you do uh, have any follow up questions, you can outreach to Katie or myself and uh, we can put you in contact with any of the speakers as necessary. Okay. Great so workshop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for Thank attending, everybody. Much. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.